Greetings, everybody, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. We gather today for Peter Mary's doctoral defense. His doctoral dissertation titled Volution and Integrative Theory of the Holographic and Translinear Dynamics of Life. This event is designed to assess the doctoral candidate's contribution to the field of knowledge and his ability to express it in writing, formal presentation, and an interactive discussion. First, I will ask Peter to present his research and his thesis in maximum 15 minutes. Once he concluded, I will ask Dr. Jude Carivan, his major advisor, to comment on Peter's dissertation and research. Once they finished, I will ask Dr. Jim Garrison, the president of Ubiquity University and the Wisdom School. Once they concluded, I will ask Dr. Will Tegel, the Dean of the Wisdom School, which after Dr. Kingsley Dennis, the external examiner, will ask questions from Peter and have a brief, brief discussion. And I will be the last person to have a discussion with Peter. Once I bring this session to a close, I will ask Peter and the whole audience to leave this Zoom platform for the dissertation committee to discuss the outcome of the examination, which result I will convey to Peter. Now, over to you, Peter. Great, thank you, Georgie. Well, I was saying to a couple of people who were on earlier that I had a dress rehearsal for this in dream time this morning. And I would like to create the setting for this conversation <clears throat> that was present in that dream, which was, allowing ourselves to imagine that we're actually gathered around a campfire late at night. It's a very clear sky, the stars are visible, the cosmos is present. There's just enough fire left to cast an orange light on the face of these <clears throat> people gathered in the inner circle, as well as those who have gathered in the outer circle to bear witness, as well as anyone else who in the future or apparent past may resonate with this event. So ultimately, as we gather here, the perspective I'm holding on our conversation is that we are the Earth exploring a perspective. And ultimately, I am the Earth speaking to itself right now. And you are the Earth listening to itself right now. And we are the Earth exploring this evolutionary perspective to see whether it might fit ourselves better than the previous ways of understanding ourselves as the Earth that we have developed. So it's a story that unfolds around the campfire. And the story picks up for me when I was immersed in the theories of Ken Wilbur and developmental psychology and in particular spiral dynamics and had thrown myself into understanding that and applying that in the world and actually as the theory predicts reached a certain point where I was starting to grow uneasy with some of these maps some of these understanding of, of ourselves and the world and <clears throat> that's what triggered my inquiry that led to this evolution thesis two major tensions that I felt with the existing more linear models of development and evolution. One was that as I explored the world of energetics and ancient civilizations, I began to realize that the perspectives and technologies that they developed and were holding there were not necessarily less complex back at this purple or second stage of development. Um, than our technologies and perspectives seem to be today. And that's not necessarily the center of gravity of those societies, but they certainly had insights and technologies that we are only just, in a way, rediscovering. So how does that fit with a linear developmental model where we go from <clears throat> less complexity to more complexity? So that was one impulse that was niggling at me for years. 
And then the second main uh, impulse was when I was involved in, a, in an embodied dance experiment with a man called Dylan Newcomb, who was exploring the spiral dynamics through uh, body and movement and sound and putting hundreds of dancers through these workshops. What we discovered was that as they went through, they went through the first four levels of the spiral from the spiral dynamics model in a, in a set of eight in an octave. And then something remarkable happened at the midpoint where it didn't just move to the next level, but it seemed to flip and where the fifth level suddenly seemed to mirror the fourth level, but in a slightly more subtle way than the fourth level had. And then the sixth level seemed to mirror the third and the seventh, the second and the eighth, the first. So there was something going on in that process that was less linear than the model uh, predicted. And so it was in that context that I started to explore through my PhD and the workshops that I was in, you know, what, how to make sense of this, because it, it was uneasy with me, the current way of, of, of understanding things. And a particular insight I remember came in at the, uh, one of the Chartres uh, events that the Wisdom School was holding when um, there was a presentation on uh, cosmometry by Marshall Lefferts. And on the screen, he had this moving image of, of the jitterbug, which was like the geometry of a torus moving in and out between these two poles. And I suddenly, it's like you get these kind of instant uh, downloads of that this was a key part of reframing the more linear developmental evolutionary models that we had before. And I was sitting one day th looking at this and thinking about evolution on the one hand and then involution on the other hand, um, <clears throat> as has been described in the theories. And thinking, they're not two different things. This is one process and it looks like a torus. And that was all that I knew at that point. But then I was so, but well, what do these things have in common, involution and evolution? How do we combine them to make them one process? And of course, I suddenly realized what they have in common is volution. You just drop the in and the air and you get volution. I didn't know what it meant. I remember looking it up online and seeing that it meant spin. And then all sorts of things clicked into place for me because I knew that the torus spun. I knew that cells spun. I know our planet spins. I know our galaxy spins. So spin seems to be at the heart of all life. And so then I knew I was onto something uh, with volution. And the basic thesis is that rather than us going linear developmentally from one stage to another actually everything comes out of a creative tension between two poles a pole of the now and a pole of the potential future and it's like a niche in the ecology where life has a feeling that something's missing, that the current situation is inadequate, and that it puts a need out there, as it were, for something that needs to be filled in that niche, in that vacuum, as it were, in the ecology. And that creates a tension field between these two poles, which disturbs or, or pulls the unified field out of its stability, out of its oneness, as it were, into movement that starts to differentiate and starts to create whatever it is that needs to be created to fill that niche in the ecology. And that was where I saw the jitterbug dynamics come in because the jitterbug moves through all of the platonic solids that of course are the basic building blocks of life in terms of the life that we can see. So that process for me was describing how <clears throat> things come into form through more subtle forms in, in, until at some point those, those waves of, of probability start to come into coherence in such a way that they, they cohere to the extent that they become standing waves and we can actually see them and witness them in our 3D reality. But instead of it being a, a linear process going up this way, it's actually a process of continual breathing in and out, and we know how ancient traditions have talked about like the cosmic breath. It's a breath in and out between the gross and the subtle and bouncing up to the cause and the original impulse. And so I could see how the torus 
as a form was fitting that concept. Around the torus has, of course, this brain, this membrane around the edge that then also comes right into the center. So it goes up and around and into the center. And <clears throat> I was coming to understand that, that the information that was going to come, that was going to inform the reality that was being manifest was actually held on the skin of the torus, was held on the brain, the membrane of the torus. And that just as in the way that we make holograms with light uh, shining through, consciousness, as it were, light shines through the skin of the torus and with inside of this toroidal form, the different shapes and waves and, and relative reality starts to take form um, until it clicks in at this um, at the material plane, we should say. And that was one of the other things I'd come across is that the that this description of a 90 degree shift in planes, which hadn't meant anything to me until I saw some images both of the galaxy from NASA, which had a big bulb here and a big bulb there, and then this this kind of plane of where our galaxy was spinning here, that, in, that as those standing waves come into coherence, boom, they then manifest out in this um, way at the, at the 90 degree plane. So then I, that, I was beginning to get a sense of how these dynamics work. Um, and noticing that if you take, for example, the model of spiral dynamics, which is, is just one example of the underlying pattern, then what happens is that in that impulse at the base level, you've got beige, um, which is this body-based uh, survival. It's pre-cognitive unity consciousness. So it's not even aware of the fact that it's experienced life in a unified way, but it's just being. And then you've got turquoise, which is this post-cognitive unity consciousness. So it is aware of the unity experience that it's having, but they're both unity consciousnesses and what happens is that they're in they're in resonance with each other so level one resonates with level eight and level two resonates with level seven which could explain why let's say the shamans or the leaders of those early civilizations were able to access information of a level of complexity that we're only just rediscovering because they were able to shift their state and access those higher information fields that they were in resonance with and those two those first two stages the beige and purple and then yellow and uh, turquoise at the top form a kind of yin based system so they're the they're they're more focused on unity but if we look at the central four systems they're all about distinction and discernment and much more yangness and so our whole civilization has evolved primarily from the red up to the green and not only did we evolve, but we, in, in making that shift from purple to red, we didn't transcend and include, we transcended and we uh, uh, disassociated from the previous experience. So we cut off our sense of identity as the earth, we suppress the feminine, we suppress the body, anything that had been in that previous phase, we basically got rid of uh, or pushed down, which created a, has created, of course, enormous trauma and is why our whole civilization is shaking the way it is. You can see the Taurus form in the Purba, where this bottom, these, the knife here, the blade, this is what you stick in the earth. It's the earth, earth form, the first two phases, you could say. At the top, the, the stupa is where we meditate and access higher realms. And then in the middle is the transformation uh, space of the vira now when you cut off the blade the knife then this can't sit in the earth it's just going to fall over and become wobbly. so a key piece that we have to do as we um, proceed as humanity and heal our relationships to each other in the earth is reintegrate those earlier stages in ourselves and that is what happens as we pass the midpoint. We reintegrate previous points as we come back out to create the, the, the embodied wholeness that will enable us to co-creatively um, be part of a positive future for life on Earth.
Thank you, Peter. Wonderful presentation. Jude, over to you. Thank you, Georgie, and thank you, Peter. It was indeed a beautiful presentation. Um, what I'd like to, to begin with is the level of, you know, the state of the pioneering work that Peter has done. Because one of the things that became very clear very early on as, as being Peter's major advisor was how much he was pushing himself to understand not just on an intellectual level, but through experiential and embodiment. And towards the end of his PhD, he acknowledges just what a journey that has been and is, of course, a continuing one. One of the things that challenged us both, especially Peter, but I, I kept having a go at him, was the terminology of, of this exploration. Because, you know, there's an old say, a saying that those that understand don't speak and those that speak don't understand. So actually transforming this exploration of volution into language was something that I credit Peter enormously for. And it has been a journey of great challenges. Um, but very, I think, very helpful both for Peter himself, but for anyone who accesses this dissertation and is part of this pioneering impulse, this need, this opportunity of volution at the moment in our own human journey. Um, and so I felt that the work that was taken to actually provide a language and definition right at the beginning of the thesis, the dissertation, was, was very helpful and worth the work to, to put into that. Um, the point of this pioneering aspect is that the, the perception of reality we are at at this moment is one that I just highly wonder whether as humanity we've ever been at this point before. And what I found particularly valuable within Peter's dissertation was the way in which he was seeking to understand a deeper perspective of the nature of reality, but always bringing back to what it means to be human, what it means to be a microcosmic co-creator, what it means to be a point of consciousness, what it means to be having a human incarnation at this amazing point. And one of the things that he discovered and explored in depth was both through his own experiences and the past experiences, but how this all came together in a very simple but no simpler perspective of the mirroring of the unity of the whole differentiated into essentially holographic dynamic patterning of information, um, and how that allowed this perspective of inner and outer exploration that was a breathing process. You know, one of the things that I write in my book is that our universe, we talk of the Big Bang, but the exquisite nature of this volutionary process is, is rather more like a big breath. And so again, we come back to the ancient wisdom of the breathing and, 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 and moving forward together. I loved and, and really applauded his heavy lifting of understanding not just the ancient wisdom and the experiencing of those perennial insights into the nature of reality and evolution, but his determination to get to grips with the leading edge science of this, both through Ken's work and others' work, through Irvin's work, through my own, and many others on this direction of travel of essentially um, a con all is consciousness of unity awareness of unified reality and how it differentiates through this dynamic process and also to recognize that both Peter's work and all of us this is a work in progress this is perhaps as coming to a deeper understanding perhaps a better story but to also recognize as he does that this seventh and eighth level that we're navigating at the moment of the spiral dynamics model reflects the archaic, reflects the beingness, reflects the deep insight through altered states of consciousness of the ancients. And I think that's both very powerful, it's also very honoring of, of their wisdom, and it's also empowering, I think, for us as a species as we do navigate this process. 
The other thing that I felt was particularly helpful was to expand the notion of what living means. Um, we've, you know, come into a very narrow perspective of what life means and what living means. And Peter's whole exposition and exploration is to essentially expand that perspective so that, um, as Dwayne Elgin talks about in the living universe, but all is consciousness at play and therefore all is livingness, beingness, doingness at play at whatever levels of awareness that embodies and expresses. I also appreciate how Peter himself perceives the dissertation, despite the, the amount of time it took and perhaps the human urge to, to put a, a, a period at the end of the sentence on it, but very much as an open system in itself. Um, and so the conclusion which identified his learning from this, and it was a very deep learning, his own, you know, I think he, at the end of this, is, is a, a different person in that sense than began this. Um, but also that the very process, the research and the writing of the dissertation for him was a evolutionary process for him. Um, and also the recognition that it is a work in progress, um, that it continues and that he's been able to identify questions that are still open for him, both in an intellectual and an embodied and experiential way. And I applaud that. My own tutor, my own major advisor many years ago, right at the beginning of my thesis, said, don't see this as a destination, see it as a continuing journey of exploration and helping to give you the tools to continue that journey of exploration. So I applaud Peter for his journey so far, and I send him my love and best wishes for the ongoing journey of exploration and discovery that he'll no doubt make in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, very much. Well, Peter is very fortunate to have you <clears throat> as his major advisor, and I would like to take the opportunity to Thank you, Jude, on behalf of the whole Wisdom School and Ubiquity University for guiding and advising Peter. I'm sure that you had amazing discussions throughout the years and uh, I wish to have listened to it because I'm sure it was just exciting. So thank you again, Jude. Really, really appreciate it and the whole school. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor. I've loved every moment of it. So thank you. Dr. Jim Garrison, your turn. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jude, for uh, your eloquent uh, comments about the depth to which Peter has plumbed in his exploration of evolution. <clears throat> I would uh, like to now uh, set forth a series of inquiries, Mr. Mary. Uh, around <clears throat> originality, how original really is your work? And as I have read through your dissertation uh, several times now, I, I want to start sequentially through the text, if I may, and ask you to clarify uh, certain uh, words and as a general comment uh, I would say that I was very impressed with um, both your understanding and literature review of contemporary reality you know Ken Wilbur you know spiral dynamics uh, you know Jude Caravan, uh, you know uh, Irvin Laszlo, uh, but I was also impressed by almost a complete lack of any vertical dimension to the dissertation. I didn't see any references to Aristotle or um, an exploration of some of the great thinkers before our time on whose shoulders we sit as mere dwarfs 
uh, who have grappled mightily with the very issue that you're taking up. And so in the course of my inquiry, I would like to elicit from you um, certain clarifications and distinctions because the purpose of my uh, time here is to tease out what exactly is original, which as you all know uh, on this panel and those of you listening as participants is the singular quality that needs to be um, uh, achieved uh, to warrant the title of a doctor of philosophy. It has to be an original contribution and therefore the dissertation should, in my view, have a, a very active discussion with the giants of the past. But let's start um, with some of your terms. And I'd like to start with, uh, on page um, two here, uh, with your notion of consciousness. Now I found that very interesting and um, both interesting and a bit troubling. I'm not sure that what consciousness is, is an interior perspective of ultimate oneness. Because as you know, consciousness can go in many different directions. Uh, the Tibetan Buddhists, for example, uh, define consciousness uh, not as an interior perspective of ultimate oneness, but as a combination of awareness as a neutral phenomenon that can be oriented to oneness, but oriented conversely, and how the Tibetans understand consciousness is a combination of awareness and memory. For the Tibetans, there's no true consciousness without memory. Awareness is not enough. Memory, a, uh, a connectivity with all the events in the past from the first big breathing, to use Jude's terms, is necessary for, conscious, for awareness to be conscious. So the dimensions of past and present and future are inherent in consciousness. So I'd like to, to have you just comment on your um, uh, very, I would say, limited, limiting notion of consciousness. I understand it was, the, it's, it's done for the purposes of uh, this dissertation, but uh, are you sure that what consciousness is, is simply an interior perspective of the ultimate oneness? <clears throat> well, am I sure? No, I'm not 100% sure of anything here, but um, you use the word awareness and memory. And for me, uh, the way I make sense of it is awareness is an interior experience, as is memory. It's an, it's, it's an interior experience of the reality that we experience around us. So consciousness first, consciousness as an interior experience, I believe, fits with a, an understanding of awareness um, and memory. At the same time, I believe it is not just a human phenomena. You know, I think all life has an awareness of um, the life around them, um, has a connection to the memory fields. So when I say maybe ultimate oneness points too much in the direction of, you know, the absolute, um, whereas really it's of everything, you know, and so memory from the uh, evolutionary perspective is held in the information field. So everything that has happened, that ever has happened, is held there as, a, as, as memory. And our consciousness, awareness, and memory can access that information uh, at any time and from any place, as they show non-linearly, non almost out time, outside of uh, time and space in that way. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe putting the ultimate in there 
um, it would be better just to point to every, to everything. As, as Jude's saying, it's hard to find the language for it. But I do think I do the distinction, <clears throat> you know, and ultimately, you know, Ken, when he takes his four quadrants, has taken the first kind of distinction that you can make beyond oneness. You know, there's an interior, an exterior, an individual, and a perspective. Um, so if we're going to say there is an individual, an interior, and an exterior, I'd say the consciousness or awareness and memory is an interior experience of the exterior. Well, that leads me to Rupert Sheldrake and his notion that consciousness is not an interior experience at all. Consciousness, according to Rupert, is a field. Mm -hmm. And just like our minds are not an epiphenomena of our brains, our brains are kind of nodes receiving uh, uh, instruments for a larger, you know, morphogenetic field. So again, I'd like to just push on this notion that consciousness is an interior phenomenon. Um, uh, uh, many thinkers would, would say with Rupert and um, a number of others we'll get to in the course of this inquiry, it's a field. And so that the, the distinctions uh, between interior and exterior, remembering the Buddha's notion of anatta, that there is no separate self, there is no interior as opposed to an exterior. There's just a field of energetic connectivities. So in light of that, um, uh, say more about this definition of consciousness as an interior phenomenon. Yeah, I would say, I'd say this is the way I'm, I'm using it, right? And I, and, and I do think there's a difference because you use on the one, when you described originally, you talked about awareness, which for me is an interior experience of an exterior reality. And but then you use the word field and field for me, by its nature, you're describing an object, a field, something out there. So in that sense, if we are going to make a distinction between an interior and an exterior, and of course, ultimately, there is no distinction. Right. I mean, let's just name that first. Ultimately, ultimately, there is no distinction. It's all a oneness. It's all one thing. Um, however, for us to have a. a uh, a, a conversation in language which by its definition is relative we need to make some distinctions so if we're going to make those distinctions the interior exterior distinction um, I think is a useful one and the word field for me evokes something there whereas the word consciousness or awareness evokes something here um, and so we we could from a exterior perspective describe consciousness as a field from an exterior perspective we could be saying oh yeah consciousness is a field but that's not the interior experience of consciousness that's the awareness of the field let's say good thank you uh then i'd like to just probe your your uh orientation toward your definition of life <laughs> you know life is uh it's like love it's very uh, we know what it is, uh, but it's almost impossible to truly define. And I'd like for you to just say a little bit more. Again, it, is, it, it felt a little limiting. Um, is what life is, is life really an impulse of consciousness that seeks ever greater differentiation? <clears throat> or is the impulse that seeks ever greater differentiation one aspect of life among others because we also know that all life dies so as freud pointed out in his his um, final uh, works you know life is a continuum a complexio as he said between eros and thanatos Everything that lives dies. So would you really say that what life is is, is, is just a, uh, an impulse toward greater differentiation and interrelatedness in our universe? Uh, no, but then you've missed out two words in my definition there, which is and process. So life is an impulse of consciousness and process 
that seeks ever greater differentiation and interrelatedness in our universe. So I guess the distinction I'm making is if you have the absolute or the, the unified field, which uh, Buckminster Fuller and um, folks is, it's a static, the unified field, it's a field of potential, but it's not in movement yet. And he describes, they describe the geometry of it. But something happens to bring it, bring a movement into play that then starts to, is what I would describe as life from that the unified field, which in a way is just sitting there in the way I'm using it, uh, isn't life. Well, it's life when it comes into, as it were, relativity, when it comes into relative being and development. And so anything and everything that is um, in that process um, is part of life and indeed uh, death as well. Because once it comes into the, let's say, this manifest, these standing waves, um, then you start to see the, ma the, material, the material world disintegrate, of course. And that also is part of the life uh, process until it returns to the field to inform the field, as it were, of the future. And that uh, ideally that dying, that process of dying, um, and, dis and disintegration fertilizes the soil for future life. So the process in which things are let go of, be it your life is let go of, or be it an organizational process or practice, or be it the way in which a log of wood disintegrates, ideally happens in such a way that it fertilizes the soil for the next iterations of life, as it were. Okay, good. Uh, moving to page 20, and, and uh, I've got uh, four or five of these, but I'm just trying to tease out uh, what you're actually saying here. On page 20, when you talked about the Trinity, mm. uh, you said that your thesis is that looking out at the world, we can see for every entity at every level three things. A boundary field, an aspect of an entity that we can perceive with our five senses, and an aspect of reality that exists between the two. Now that is uh, potentially um, a certainly uh, provocative notion that between the field and the entity, there's a something in between. And um, this reminds me of the great debate between cosmologists and physicists around whether ether exists. Hmm. Because you're, you're coming into a, a, a great debate about the fundamental nature of reality. Is it as the Buddha held, one thing? There's no gaps anywhere. There's no space in between of anything. That's the illusion of separateness, he said. But you're postulating a very specific cosmology, Mr. Mary. Mm -hmm. You are saying that there's an aspect of reality that exists between the entity and the boundary field. And I'd, I'd like you to explain that and, and defend that notion uh, because it runs counter to the metaphysical speculations of, a, of a, a, a whole lot of serious people over time. Well, I don't think it does, actually, because I think <laughs> you're, conf you're confusing, uh, in this Christian tradition, Father and God, right? In the Christ when you look at my table of the Trinity, when Buddha refers to it's all one thing, I I've already said, you know, yes, Absolutely. And there's nothing more we can say about that. So if you're going to write a PhD dissertation, you're really exploring the rest, right? The relative reality. You, know, you can't really write a PhD dissertation on the absolute because language can never do it justice. Poetry starts to point towards it, but ultimately not. As I, um, and I think in the dissertation, I make that distinction between the total oneness, which say in tradition, Christian tradition would be referred to as the God, but then the field, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the field of an entity. So that's already moved into the relative world. 
right? And that field holds the information, it bounds the entity, it's the soul, you could say, of the entity. Um, and then you've got the kind of current manifestation, then you've got all the dynamics that are going on in between. So I think the important, that what I, when I say boundary, I'm not referring to the oneness, ultimate, absolute oneness of everything. I'm referring to the unified field of a particular entity, which when you are that entity, um, you, you experience as the unity, because it's like the fish in water. But it's that distinction, you know, I think in the, uh, um, in the, yeah, there we go, on page 24, I have that image of the Christian Trinity and God that shows Father, Son, and Spirit, but has God at the center as the unity, ultimate oneness of everything. Yeah, well, I, again, I, I want to, I was, that was one of my points, actually. You have a statement on page 24 that Father is not the same as God. Now, you may know that uh, the great debate between Arius and Athanasius in the fourth century led to the Council of Nicaea convened by the Emperor Constantine in 327, in which this assertion that you're making was judged as heresy. And uh, there was much blood spilt over the centuries around this question of the Father in relationship to God. In, in Orthodox Trinitarian theology, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And that the, the complexio oppositorum uh, is that there uh, is, a, is a, uh, a complete unity and a differentiation simultaneously. So you're just making a very strong statement uh, when you say something like, uh, you're talking about the Christian tradition that makes a distinction between the Trinity and God, that statement contradicts the most fundamental orthodox understanding of God and the Trinity uh, in the Catholic um, uh, tradition that held for thousands of years. Um, and so I, I just want to get your well, let me respond to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, the way you described it just now, Jim, is the way I'm describing it. Because indeed, God is the description of ultimate oneness, which of course includes everything. So therefore, the Father is in God, the Son is in God, Spirit is in God, of course. But they're not the same. They're not the same, but they are transcended but in, and included by God. So they do... Everything, of course, rests in the ultimate oneness in God. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be a oneness, right? It would be a two, three, or fourness. So it all rests in the ultimate oneness. And yet when we get into, move from the absolute perspective or the absolute experience into the relative and ultimately the non-dual perspective is where we can hold absolute and relative at the same time. Non-dual is not the same as absolute. Non-dual is where we can hold absolute and relative at the same time then you can see, you know, just like you described, yeah, Father, Son, and Spirit, and they all reside in God. But Father is, is, is not the same as God. Spirit, is, unless you, you know, it's, we're not saying Spirit and Son reside in Father. We're saying Spirit and Son reside in God, as does Father. So that's a distinction between an absolute and the relative uh, perspective. So all of the relative, of course, resides in the absolute, otherwise it wouldn't be absolute. Okay, thank you. Uh, then let's pay, uh, focus on page 32, where I want to spend some time here, because it was the one citation of Aristotle, uh, quoted in, uh, in uh, Harvey. Um, but I want now to really probe um, uh, the distinctions that I think are important around the originality of your dissertation. Aristotle, uh, was the first person that we know of that held uh, a teleological position about the nature of reality. 
And I, that's why I was actually surprised you didn't go into more detail about Aristotle, uh, because he's your godfather. Uh, it was Aristotle was the first one to, to begin to intimate an evolutionary progression of life, that life was not simply being static, but it was a, it was a, what he called a teleology. And you know, his famous metaphor that every acorn becomes an oak tree, that there's something inherent in uh, life itself that pulls life toward a greater wholeness. And um, I was struck by that, and I wanted to probe that because your whole dissertation uh, was about the implications of this in human affairs and human society. Well, that's the Nicomachean ethics. That's what Aristotle was grappling with. He was grappling with this, the implications of a teleology to life. And he said that, that that had very profound implications to ethics and how humanity should govern itself and how human beings should treat each other. And that was his notion of the virtues because he said that from a teleological point of view, everything is a subset of happiness. That one of the, one of the, one of the characteristics of teleology is that embedded in all life is the desire to be happy. But that's what pulls us, he said. And there are certain virtues that you can cultivate that will lead to happiness. So just like the acorn becoming a oak tree, you can in your own span become happy by, by, by refining your virtues. And that's what makes you whole. And that's the tension. And I was just surprised that, that Aristotle seems to be absent in your dissertation. Um, and when I would love your comment on the relationship between your notion of attention of potentiality and Aristotle's notion of teleology. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, let me say first, I just um, didn't cross my path as I was uh, on my wisdom journey. Um, and certainly not, not in this, not in the, the understanding of that you just described. So, um, yeah, that's, um, something I would love to, you know, look into more is our, you know, our, Aristotle's uh, perspective on all of this. Um, I, it feels to me like the sense of teleology and that, and the, the polarity it well, that seems to be a lot of similarity a lot of relationship between that because you know the the impulse to move somewhere is the the, the polar tension i'm describing between current and potential right which, which of course isn't um new in itself um but it's that process that that um brings this whole volutionary movement in, into being and through the toroidal dynamics and the sacred geometric dynamics that go on with that um, and brings us to an understanding that it's, it, that we're not, and I and I and I don't know to what extent um, Aristotle um, saw more this kind of breathing process rather than linear evolutionary process, um, but rather than us moving to you know in a in a kind of linear evolutionary way from where we are now to this theological destiny, as it were, um, I see it much more as there is it's incoming and outgoing. It's like, uh, um, you know, it's the involutionary, um, it moves towards us. Let's say the, 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 the place we're wanting to be moves towards us and we move towards it at the same time. And that's actually the dynamic um, that goes on. And indeed, his, when you said, you know, his definition of happiness, that's what makes you whole. Well, in my description of the, of the octave, it is indeed as we pass that midpoint where we've been kind of focused on ourselves, our own identity as a part, and we start to become aware of ourselves in a bigger context and then go through, let's say, five, stage five integrates four and six integrates three, etc. We are indeed making ourselves whole because we're consciously integrating the parts of ourselves that were in the earlier journey until that wholeness potentially 
is achieved, um, whereby we've kind of, I guess, realized our potential. And then maybe that's what defines our happiness. You know, we, if, if we do indeed come in as an impulse of life, and that that's in our soul imprint, let's say, which is on the, on the membrane, on our mem the membrane of the boundary, if that's our soul imprint, then I can imagine the breath of relaxation, you know, when that and happiness that comes with growing into that potential, the, the acorn growing into the oak tree, as it were. Good. Well, uh, and I would say, just as a comment, because I think Aristotle is so fundamental in, in anyone developing a, a line of reasoning such as you are, in Aristotle's view, ethics is imbued in life itself. And so the teleology of something um, uh, is ultimately an ethical process. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, we can talk about it um, mm. um, in more detail sometime when we uh, uh, have dinner. But I'd like to turn to Hegel, because Hegel took what Aristotle's teleology and he took it to the next level up. And I, again, I would have loved to have seen a, a paragraph or two on Hegel, because what Hegel said was that there's an inherent dialectic between, as you know, the thesis and the antithesis, but it's governed by the world soul. And this goes back to Pythagoras, and I didn't note it in your dissertation, but this is another aspect that I think is worth consideration, and that is that the process itself is moving to a, a greater wholeness. Um, and for Hegel, God was imbued in the world soul, and the world soul, said Hegel, was ultimately nature itself. And so that the impulse was not coming from a gap. That's why I was challenging your notion earlier that there's somehow a gap of potentiality between the entity and the field. In Hegel's notion, the entire field is moving. And the only choice of a human being is whether you're going along with the program or you're not. Mm -hmm. But that the, 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 the tension um, is, is of, of the field exerting the pull on every aspect of the field. So not only is the, in, is the entity feeling it the entire field is is so that the entity as it were is like in a river hmm. so what would be your comment on on hegel's notion in relationship to your sense of evolution well i think the concepts obviously i have to let just land for a moment because there's certain language and terms that i'm not sure how he defines them um i don't agree that the entire field is moving and you just have a choice to go along or not. Um, I believe we have a co-creative role in that, that we have the free will of the human is ultimately, you know, the, one of the things that really distinguishes us. And we can, in that process, um, if, if, we, if we have the humility um, and the accessibility to the realms that are normally invisible to us, but the realms that would be actually in that process in between, as it were, the 96% of reality that science can't measure, then I think as we engage with those realms, we become a, a co-creator. So we're not a victim. I don't, know, I don't know if that was Hegel's position, a victim of this river that we just have to decide are we going to swim upstream or allow ourselves to be carried downstream. I believe we're a co-creator of that uh, within that process, um, which is, you know, what the evolution evolutionary uh, theory describes. Um, the field exerts a pull on the field as a whole. Yeah, I can, of course, it's fractal, isn't it? So um, that, that impulse, um, that pull, I, yes, is going to be experienced everywhere. Um, but I guess somewhere, like in, like in an ecology and a niche, something emerges to try to re respond to that pull, a certain 
form, you know, a certain form of life comes as a response to that pull. And it may not be an individual entity, but also maybe a collection of entities. Um, but yeah, I can, I, can, I can go with the idea that the field exerts a pull on the field as a whole from a, a kind of fractal holographic perspective, yeah. Yeah, and then just as a, as a point, that's the beauty of Pythagoras. You know, Pythagoras was actually the original one to say, and that's why he coined the term cosmos, that the universe was not enough for him, that the, 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 the Greek term cosmos is a jewel, because he said ultimately what we're in, inside of is a cosmic poem, a cosmic song, a cosmic note that has coherence and it has movement toward higher and higher levels of wholeness as we return to the Godhead itself. You know, Plotinus's notion that the universe breathes. Back to what Jude is saying, it wasn't a big bang, it was a big breath. And that breath is a song. It's an intentional expression of joy. And in that regard, and I want to move on, but just so you know the richness of, of the giants, I just want to read a quick word from Wordsworth, where he's saying, grappling with these issues, this is so beautiful. What he says is moving it along is a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. A sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all sentient things, all objects of all thought and roll through the entire manifest universe. So this notion, I just want to leave you with mm. that it's the whole. Yeah. Well, I mean, that fits. But I would say also in terms of your quest for originality, the thing which I haven't heard any of them mention, you know, at the moment there's a teleology of one direction. Uh, but what I'm suggesting that ties in more modern psychology is that the further you want to move up, as it were, into light or wholeness, the more of your work you have to do to heal and integrate the pain, trauma, and past. So, but they happen, it's they're like twin particles. You know, they're tied to each other. You want to go here, then you're going to have to deal with this. And, and this is holding the energy that can be released in order for this to be able to unfold. And there you see in Stan Groff's work, for example, and, and other modern transpersonal psychologists, the story of how the journey into the future is so intrinsically linked to our journey into our past. Well, thank you for that. And that leads me, uh, Georgia, I only have one more question. Uh, <laughs> but this was so rich. This was so rich. I, uh, I was exhilarated at the, uh, at, the, at the dissertation. So I'm probing deeply. And it leads me actually to page 120. Uh, and your uh, narrative of your personal trauma. And your last comment is what I want to explore. Um, I'd like you to, to talk about evil. Hmm. We often talk about shadow. But I'd like to get your understanding of evil, knowing, as the philosophers have said, that evil is the rock against which all systems shipwreck. We have our tidy little categories. And then there's the phenomenon of evil, that, that there appears to be an intelligence, a force, a wrecking ball in the cosmos that um, contravenes and contradicts all that is in a highly paradoxical way. Um, so talk to us about your understanding of evil in the cosmos and how that plays out in our pursuit of wholeness mm -hmm. just small questions right 
consciousness life. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> this is a um, man. <laughs> no, no, good. No, I like those. Evil. Well, if indeed, you know, what I'm postulating is true that light has an equivalent in dark, right? That, there, that there's this twin particle relationship in a way between the two, then the greater the light, the clearer the shadow. Um, and so we'd expect um, if, e if evil is that which is in a way moving us away from where life wants to move us. So instead of towards greater wholeness, differentiation into the parts, it's collapsing us into a sense of separation um, and a sense of loneliness and apartness and in a way therefore desperation of not being part of something um, then that that's I guess that's probably how I would think of it if the if the if the goodness or the happiness impulse is about the sense of becoming you know your highest potential becoming part of a bigger whole um, and at the same time being clearer on as you as you go on this journey of becoming a big a, a part of a bigger whole being clearer on exactly what your particular role is in that whole so your crit you become more crystallized as it were as you um, become more interconnected and more interrelated then evil in this sense would be something that draws us out of relationship that draws us, you know, into it, that contracts us into ourselves. I think there are, you know, from my energetic work, I know that what we, in our work, we call it Oranor is stressed energy and Dor is dead energy. And Dor is dead, is dead Oranor. So stressed energy that congeals and just becomes stuck. And it prevents systems from, from moving forward. It's like a dead a dead weight um, that's that's pulling you back. Um, so, our, you know, when you walk into a or you're on a journey and you encounter this this dead weight that's pulling us down, um, that I would you know see as part of this kind of description of of evil, um, something that's really in a um, pulling us into into a disintegration. But that is giving that maybe. You know, as we've moved from here to here, and we're having to deal with this, that also uh, is the poison that has the medicine. The poison is the medicine. That, that, you know, as we resolve, we have to resolve that. It is what gives us access to more light. So in a way, as we transform that darkness, the light increases at the same time. It's beautiful. I mean, it reminds me, you know, the great line of Mephistopheles to Faust in in Goethe's Faust, where he says, I am the spirit that seeks ever to do evil, and yet ever contributes to the good. So that notion of the poison being the potion, ultimately, uh, is a very profound notion. Well, thank you, Mr. Mary. Uh, my line thank of- you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim and Peter very rich discussion you're a good defender peter now i pass the word on to <laughs> to dr will tegel good uh, thank you so much uh we're in the spirit of uh the massive movement of mother earth and shuddering through climate change so uh, if if I fade out, we'll do what we can do uh, with the connection. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, good. This this past week, we had a stellar course centered around beautiful four and five thousand year old water coming out of Earth's loins that were helping us give birth to a new era. And Peter, you, <clears throat> your dissertation fits very well in the birthing pains of a new consciousness in our world as we experience today. And in fact, I would say, 
several dissertations over the past 18 months all have been pulled forth by mooring within our life together that are moving from one dimension of earth being to another. You touch briefly on the Hopi prophecy. And like Jim, I want to rubber band back to that for just a moment. I understand that you can't satisfy all of us in our own idiosyncratic interests. <laughs> uh, but I would like to point out something that you do miss in your brief connection with the Hopi prophecy. And that is <clears throat> the oral tradition of many indigenous people states in distinction to the modern story of humans that there have been four cycles of the human story. And unlike spiral dynamics, which traces that consciousness from beige up through turquoise and, and even further now, uh, these stories tell us that the human cycle of the Taurus, the breathing that you so beautifully describe, has happened four times. In other words, there have been a brief, an inhale, and then what we call the big bang is entropy or an exhale. And that, that, that this has happened four times, and we're in the fourth. And <clears throat> It's not that the ancient shaman were the only ones who were able through transordinary consciousness to access this higher level on the spiral, but rather there were whole civilizations, whole worlds that were able to reach very elevated manifestations of consciousness and technology. And that there's a beginning and mid middle and end to this in, in this cycle. And that because of our arrogance in contemporary thought, we, we have missed the developmental phases of these four cycles. And related to that, we now know in geological studies that Pangaea has happened. We're in the fourth cycle of Pangaea. In other words, Earth herself has been, the continents have been together and then through entropy have separated and then they come together and then they separated and they come together so that this massive breathing of the planet has happened four times, which interestingly coincides with the Hopi prophecy. This last week we had one of the chief elders of the Aboriginal people from Australia here with us, Miliwana. And when I asked Miliwana, 50 to 70 years old, uh, uh, the story of the Aboriginal. When I asked her about that, she laughed and laughed and laughed. She said, well, of course, we were present in, in one of the Pangeas. Do you see that? That would, that would put the human story back in our way of measurement several million years. So I just want to point out that when you get to what I think is quite original description of the Taurus, you are probing something that has its roots very deep in human consciousness. 
So I, I, I really appreciate that. And, and here's the thing. Um, early on, you speak about uh, Plato and, and the uh, parable of the cave, the allegory of the dark cave, which you say uh, with projections on the back wall of the cave being caused by sunlight streaming in and creating multiple movements shadows that people in the cave the shadows as the reality and forget to look to the source of the shadows as more fundamental uh i love that i love your basically uh uh you're questioning that allegory and in a in in a in a fundamental way but subtle and I would have hoped that you would even questioned it further because as Jim knows, uh, I am as hard on the degree as he is on Abrahamic religions. And I, I love this phrase that you say, we tend to see the visible world as all there is, whereas a hook, whereas, and this is this whereas, your dissertation turns, in my view, on that whereas. Whereas a holographic perspective suggests it may be a projection of information stored at a more fundamental level of reality on the surface of tor a Taurus bubble. Now, that is original. And it goes much deeper than Plato's understanding of reality, in my view. So I appreciate that. The other thing that I really appreciate is that you're willing to question not only the moorings of the wisdom school by questioning that basic allegory, but you also are willing to question your own moorings and understanding of spiral dynamics and uh, Ken Wilber's view of spiral dynamics. I want to uh, call to your attention a couple of things, and then I have some, I have a question at the end of all of this. <laughs> uh, you say the main difference between Wilbur's model of vertical stages and volution thesis is that Wilbur only explores the vertical unfolding in which an earlier stage holds the implicate order that becomes explicate at the next, whereas volution suggests that there is an implicate to explicate dynamic that also works from the outside of the torus in through the resonance between polarities of levels in the octave as described above. In other words, if you, if you see this toroidal motion, there, there, is, there is an entropy that pushes to the edge of the torus, and there's a centropy that pulls to the center. And this is all happening in the eternal now. And that Wilbur's understanding of reality at that point is woefully simplistic. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. And that you point that out, that rather than having up and down, or even spirals, is woefully inadequate and captured in the holographic movement of the Taurus. That's, that's, uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful contribution to my thinking. Uh, I would point out, uh, you, you say at one point, uh, the transcendence and the subsendence happen in parallel, like a tree having to grow deeper roots in parallel to higher branches. In that sense, it grows out from the center. And then you, you uh, connect that with Jude's description of the life process. And uh, 
Now I would like for you to comment on the difference between that parallel movement and paradoxical movement. <clears throat> One sec on that, Will. Um, can I just ask you a question first? Uh, would you say that the, the spiral dynamics model is basically describing just the fourth cycle of the Hopi uh, cycles? I, I, yeah, no, I would say that the spiral dynamics limitation is that it assumes that this has happened only one time. Mm -hmm. And according to the Aboriginal visions, this is the fourth time that we've been through this. And that for the three other times, there have been wise people, in fact, whole civilizations that have grasped these upper realms that you miss, that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and through uh, various impacts, mostly climate change, have uh, those worlds have come to an end. So, so four times that a that a civilization has been through evolutionary process, basically, as I described. Exactly, there have been four major inhales and exhales. Okay. So, just your so your question, um, where I was talking about how the transcendence and subsendence, or the involution and evolution, and the stretching up and reaching down, um, go on in parallel, and so it's. Um, extending out from the center, as it were. What was your question was, how does that image relate to when they're contradictory, you mean, or? Okay, so you describe that movement as parallel. Mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm interested in, I'm not excluding that, but how does that relate to their paradoxical relationship as well as their parallel relationship? So how they contrast. Yes. Well, and this, uh, this was the image I actually got in my dream this morning, so it's not surprising that you would point, evoke it. <laughs> um, but it, and, and that um, reflects this email I got from Kaylin with this image in that um, comes from Minkowski's space-time model, which is a more where Minkowski was actually Einstein's teacher. And it has the, the observer right at the center, and it has the plane here, and then it has the future time cone here and the past time cone here. So if you were gonna contrast them, then for example, the uh, evolutionaries movement that I've seen emerge over the last years that have taken a part of Wilbur's understanding and the uh, evolutionary psychology understanding and just kind of gone with the transcendence uh, hasn't engaged in the need to do the subsendence to the twin particle as it were to release those uh, energies so you can see some movements focusing purely on the transcendent movement or reaching into the future and at the same time, you can see people get a bit lost in, let's say, you know, spending their whole time in therapy, just kind of reaching down into the past and digging deeper and deeper and deeper, whilst not at the same time engaging in a journey of growth, as Jim was describing earlier, into their higher uh, purpose. So I guess what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm pointing to is they go hand in hand, you know, it's not one or the other but you can't transcend without subsend. And if you're subsending, then there's a transcendent energy that's released as well that is also, that is part of the teleological journey, let's say, that is also behoves us to be engaging in. I'm not sure if that was what you were trying to get at, but. <laughs> well, y yes, in a way, but what I'm thinking about is that the tension that Bucky Fuller calls tensegrity, the tension, yeah. tension between between, not just parallel, it's the tension, and it's the tension that itself releases consciousness to yeah. more dimensional uh, base, a more dimensional base. But yeah. thank you for that. And then I want to, uh, uh, I want to leave time for everyone to make the comments. So I just have two more questions. Uh, 
later on in your dissertation, you say one of the critical reasons that evolution is important is around how people experience conception as their relationship to nature. So I use nature to mean the physical, non-human life on planet Earth. So tell me about that. Did I really say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a quote. Um, oh, wow. Uh, did I not? And I didn't define nature up front, no. Um, what did I say? Physical, non, no, non in, in other places, In other places, yeah. you, you, you do well. You define it in a much more comprehensive way. But yeah, I just, no, I wouldn't. No. Then please, yeah, let me know what page that is in, and I'll correct that, because no, I mean, nature. Oh God, we're getting into definitions again, but of course it includes uh, humans. You know, it's the, the perspective I was trying to evoke at the beginning where ultimately we are the earth right now having this conversation. Uh, that's, that's nature at play. Yeah. yeah, good, good. Okay, then, then finally, uh, uh, you, you say, uh, um, let me see if I can find this. Oh, yes. Oh. When humans are seen within nature, you're correcting that earlier statement here, by the way. And, and by the way, I just want to say that I would expect in your dissertation that you would be like all of us. You would be like Einstein. That is, you would get out on the bridge leading to this newer consciousness, and you would see what is over there. And like him, it would scare the bejesus out of you. And you would, you would look back to the other side. And that's what we, in my view, that's what I do. That's what I suspect we all do. And so it, it would be natural that you would make a statement like that about uh, 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 nature. But you soon correct yourself later on. And, and you say, when humans are seen within nature, then the notion of communing with nature. And I say... Uh, I'd like to hear you comment on the difference between communing with nature and communication within nature. <clears throat> I think actually the distinction is in your use of the word within, communicating within uh, nature rather than communicating with, because uh, communing with, because communing with suggests a separation. Um, communicating within suggests that, you know, we are part of, um, so, um, and, th and therefore that nature, you know, well, the, you know, it's hard to, <laughs> to put into words, isn't it? but, but, uh, um, that there is information that flows between us and the world around us all the time. And it's actually about us becoming more conscious of those information flows. Um, which is, you know, part of what I describe in the eco-intention work is you actually learn to um, uh, receive information from uh, the trees in, in, our, in, a certain, in our own way. You know, we create a language, an agreement around language that enables us to have that communication, uh, as it were. Um, but ultimately, the interesting thing is that that has to happen through the body. It's the body that receives the information, the communication. And so when you douse or when you muscle test or whatever, that's just an extension of the body's um, movements. So <clears throat> that which fits the, you know, as we, as we in turquoise um, enter this conscious unity space where indeed um, it becomes normal that we should be able to communicate with um, life and nature around us. We have to, um, reintegrate our relationship to the body and therefore also the, the earth because it's that that enables us to have that relationship um, so i think you know you're, you you actually gave me the, the answer there when you said within rather than with and i think that's the difference <laughs> it's good well thank you so much for this for this uh, dissertation and uh uh the, the I, I would say what i really appreciated was meeting you in a new way and more complete way as as i read so thank you thank you will for everything i've learned from you over the years thank you will i'm very pleased that the internet connection held and storm didn't affect much of your contribution 
now. Dear Kingsley Dennis, please. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, can you hear me fine? Good. Well, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Peter, for your uh, energetic presentation. Thank you to Jude for your comments and uh, for the wonderful uh, philosophic debate from Jim and Will. Um, so, Peter Merrick, Volution, an Integrative Theory of the Holographic and Translinear Dynamics of Life. You must be proud. Uh, this, is quite a, this is quite a thesis. And so, from my role as external examiner, I make a few comments and I perhaps won't be as expansive in the philosophy, but I'd like to get into a, a few questions. But first off, Peter, um, I'd like to say that it's a, it's a very comprehensive, complex and sustained body of work. Um, you've demonstrated the ability to develop research and pursue your lines of inquiry competently and with a wide range of the referencing materials. Um, also, I think you've shown, which is a strong point, uh, self-referencing awareness, is that you're a, you are able to point to your own limiting factors. Uh, again, as we've discussed already, or has been discussed, uh, the limiting factors of vocabulary and terminology and your own experiences. Um, you've definitely demonstrated a good grounding in the background literature in the physical, social sciences, uh, including the physics, new sciences, complexity systems, uh, cultural studies, psychology, philosophy, perennial traditions, the wisdom traditions, uh, including Hermeticism, Kabbalah, Gnosticism. Uh, you even put together spiral dynamics, chakras, and the I Ching. It's quite a mix. Um, so it, it's, it's a, you know, I think a point of success that you've, you've reached to this point of coherency. Um, your philosophical inquiry and your grounded theory, very strong. And also what I found uh, particularly, not only intriguing, but which was important to this thesis, was uh, your organic inquiry. In that you put in your own uh, personal, uh, psychological, psychic and meditative experiences. And you were candid enough to, to point out some uh, factors which um, troubled you. So for me, that added to this thesis, because what I think is important is that it's a very humane thesis, and that you've welded that with the theoretical part. So it's like building a house. I found that your, your first couple of chapters were like building the foundations. Uh, they were strong in explanation, then, like building the walls in the chapters three and four with your cosmology, uh, the torus, the holographic, you are building the structures. Um, I found chapter five intriguing with the oct octave perspective, uh, with Lyra's eight brain model. Uh, a thought which came to mind is that um, in the octave, uh, there was space there to, to reference um, the, the theories of, of Gajif, perhaps, because Gajif talked about the law of octaves and, in fact, also talked about the, the law of three, the trilogy, uh, in the, the holy affirming, holy denying, and holy reconciling. So I thought there were some good, um, I say, crossovers there. Um, chapters six and seven, uh, I thought they were like the roof of the thesis in that these implications and practices and the way that you integrated with individual society and culture and nature was where you were, you were putting this thesis together. And at the beginning of this talk, uh, Jude mentioned that this is a work in progress. And if anything, I would say that area is the work in progress. You've, you've done your work, you've laid the foundations, you've built the house, and this now to, to push all this work out into society, into culture, into community, and the individual is where definitely the, the work in progress lies. And if anything, if your thesis can be um, continued and expanded uh, and uh, amplified, then obviously that, that's the area for me. So to start off, Peter, I'd like to, because it's very humane and, and, and uh, participatory research you've done, I'd like to start with you, of course. Um, did you discover, encounter something through your research or have an aha moment where everything came together 
which, which was pivotal to you in, in, in the part of your research? Well, there were, you know, there were a number of those moments. In a way, the, the research process or experience was, you know, having these just insights, really, or I guess these bits of thesis that dropped into my awareness as I was holding a question. Well, I guess that would fit the evolutionary theory, wouldn't it? Um, but then I'm me needing to make sense of those and, and seeking um reference in other places is this something other people have thought about in what way uh, testing them against um jude and seeing whether they weighed uh, with her um was there one particular well i think in terms of you know how the pieces started to come together it was that experience in chartres seeing um the cosmometry work of marshall lefferts and the and that jitterbug dynamic and i you know i couldn't write fast enough <laughs> in my notebook as it was kind of being downloaded and i was like here is something that pings these pieces together and i was already sketching the spiral out and how you know how all of that connected into it um so on a more theoretical level probably there um And, and then uh, uh, I think on a personal level, there were, it was the, um, ex the really very felt experiences of, that I describe of when of me shifting something in my interior and immediately seeing that reflected in the world or, uh, in a, around me at that time. So, you know, walking into a room and someone being in an irritated state and me finding myself getting drawn into it and then being able to take a breath and somehow change my inner state and then just seeing how that person seemed to instantly change their state at the same moment like two particles that one is changed and the other was changed and i was like, this is really true you know no inside no outside they're really one thing um that the that the, the how this the exterior reflects the interior interior reflects the exterior etc so i think there were those two moments one the philosophical as it were and theoretical and one more the personal experience one of the jitterbug uh, jitterbug epiphany and the author was uh another one was like testing out your your thesis in life no you're saying yeah although i wasn't consciously testing it well maybe I, it not yeah it just kind of happened i'd actually just come out of a really good therapy session so i was in a good space <laughs> and i was able to just flip the inner state and you know catch myself as it were at that moment and then see that instantly reflected yeah so, so to, to ask the the other the flip side of that of that coin, Peter, um, was there periods or particular period when you felt a blockage that you you something in your research wasn't flowing and you couldn't see how you could put it together and you felt uh, kind of trapped in 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 your path? Um, No, if there was a moment where I felt ever felt completely blocked, what I struggled most with was um, understanding the physics, um, and so it was such a gift to have Jude, who has both that amazing understanding of the physics on the one hand, but also the understanding of the consciousness. Um, <clears throat> because my, you know, my background is more in the arts, not in the physics and the maths, um, and yet it was part of seeing uh, Marshall's work, which was also related to Nassim Haramain's work, who I think is basically telling the same story, but from a physics perspective. Um, whereas I'm coming at it now from a per individual and collective development perspective or societal cultural development perspective. Um, that, the, that really, really trying to understand what the physics is saying and how this perspective really integrates the quantum and relative theories, which has been, you know, the amazing work that Jude has done. Um, that was that was what I was most. I noticed I had most worry or fear about that I wasn't, you know, going to be able to make sense of that and understand it and and relate it to the, the thesis that I had that I was making. Okay. Okay. Now, um, good. I mean, Peter, this is a question which obviously Jim has touched upon in that obviously uh, the thesis has to be an original piece of work. And, um, you know, 
the point is here is to get a chance for you to, to explain not only to us, but any, any of the listeners um, about your thesis. So um, now your purpose statement, uh, ambitious. <laughs> um, you, you said that your quest was to identify a way of seeing ourselves, a new way of seeing ourselves to the field that is more adequate to the dynamic interrelatedness of the world we live in. Okay, so let's put a question to you which I think Jim did touch upon, how would you defend yourself against the, the comment that your hypothesis of the, evolu the evolution model seeks not really to describe a new process, but you're using modern updated vocabulary to describe a process which has been in many traditions previously. Mm -hmm. well, and how, or put it another way, how far have you gone where no one else has gone before, to put it in Star Trek language? <laughs> <coughs> I think it's probably more in the integration of different aspects into one theory as opposed to any particular piece of it um, being uniquely original. Um, it's the, you know, obviously there's been the, the teleology, teleology, the directionality uh, piece first. There's been stuff that's been done on the the, the healing in the past, in the transpersonal psychology, there's been um, <clears throat> descriptions of the Taurus and that process, but I don't think anybody before, from what I've come across anyway, has actually related the toroidal flow and geometric process to human and individual development. I haven't seen that. I've seen it in the physics, but I haven't seen it related and used as a way to um, understand fractally how we as individuals emerge, develop, and collectively as society. So linking in the personal development and the um, uh, cultural and collective development models um, to that, uh, that process, um, I haven't seen that before. Um, obviously, because we're touching on the meaning of life here, <laughs> Much has been written about it in many different traditions before, so it would be, um, and I'm sure there's loads of stuff, as Jim has already pointed to, things that I haven't had a chance to look at and engage with, um, where people were certainly pointing at, at pieces of what it is that I'm trying to describe here. So I think I'd say it's, it's, it's originality is in, is in the integration of these different perspectives and the integrative model being the the toroidal model and the application of that to human and cultural development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, so go take taking that question further because obviously you've made this, this tapestry of all these uh, insights and, and sciences and uh, knowledge and wisdom. Now um, let's go to spiral dynamics because the spiral dynamics plays a central role in your thesis, and it's just strength. But let's also question the other side. Could it be a weakness? So my question is, is that, do you feel that you could have successfully written this thesis without having recourse to spiral dynamics? So what I'm asking is, um, what would be lacking in your thesis if you hadn't have used spiral dynamics? Oh, that's a, <clears throat> a hard one, because in a way, spiral dynamics was um, a stepping stone on my journey that got me to here in a way it was the form which engaged me as I moved into the yellow domain in my in my development um, I could have been another developmental model it could have been an, another one of the many developmental models I think um, <clears throat> But the needed, I think this, what did need to be in place, because what I see this as is really the, a step from yellow to turquoise, this journey from me, from the more systemic integral perspective of yellow into the more holistic perspective of turquoise. Um, so there would need to have been some both worldview and some practices that were resonant with the, the yellow value system in order for me to you know, have the information that would inform the next, that informs green to shift to turquoise, basically. I mean, it's the distinction between green and turquoise, the difference between green and turquoise is yellow. So spiral dynamics was one form that, a yellow form, you could say, 
that provided the stepping stone for me and my my consciousness on the on on this journey. It could have been another uh, developmental model. I think um, I don't need to go. I don't think I need to go into details now about why I what I like about spiral dynamics, what its limits and, and possibilities are. But um, I think that's the way I'd see it. Right. Oh, and so, were you aware during the the writing of the thesis that uh, that where would I be without spiral dynamics? Would I have volution? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't ask that question because um, it wasn't about spiral dynamics really. It was about the journey that I was on, and spiral dynamics showed up as part of that. So it was kind of a what Robert Piercig would call a moo question, an inadequate question, because the journey is the journey that it's been, and that's why I am here now. So to kind of hypothesize who had that journey not happened in that way, would I be here now? And that's just a line of inquiry that for me didn't seem appropriate, doesn't feel appropriate. It's that very last question at the end of the thesis that I put, it's like, well, you know, and uh, these people who say, isn't it incredible that we've ended up where we are with the, the chance of us being here, you know, based on all these universe, the way the universe has developed, and the chance is minuscule that we'd be here where we are. I don't know, it's not as perfectly obvious. We wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. So what's the point in even saying that, mm -hmm. right? The fact that we're here now is because of this process that we've been in. So um, the fact that volution has emerged is you know, due to part of the journey I've been on and had the journey been different, would evolution have emerged? Who knows? But maybe in a parallel universe somewhere. Well, there you go. I've just asked a question about a mood question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, going into your, your trilogy, um, let's see, the dynamics, the third element, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Prana, Sophia, uh, your dynamics is, is equivalent to, to these um, the feminine creative force. Uh, so within your model of dynamics, um, I mean, how, how do you feel about the, the, the feminine creative force be implicated into the individual and cr culture and society? Do you feel that you've uh, represented that uh, to your satisfaction? Well, I guess um, there's a couple of different ways to, to, to go with that. One is in terms of the theory, I would say so, because the theory is really describing the process. You know, uh, it's really describing that the dynamics, that, that, that middle piece that, that goes on, that breathing and the flow of the Taurus. <clears throat> in terms of the um, content and the way that I've communicated in the thesis, obviously, if you would to take those labels of masculine and feminine, you might say the masculine is more the objective theoretical discussion and the feminine is more the sharing of the personal experience, um, the relational side of, um, of the thesis. Um, I say probably the, the theoretical definitely outweighs the, um, the experiential. So in that sense, you might say the masculine is more present than the feminine. Um, if that's um, kind of what you're, what you're pointing to. Well, I'm, with this, well, I'm, not, I'm pointing towards any answer that you, you would just provide. Um, I wonder about whether the, the feminine creative energy, you've considered that uh, taking it further in your practical and implications that, were, uh, that you have suggested you're, you're going to research further. Well, um, Certainly the whole, you know, the whole work around information and energy and how you work with information and energy, which is working in that dynamic space. Absolutely. Um, and that's the work I continue to do uh, also, also with ubiquity and within ubiquity. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, absolutely. That's the work, you know, is to be able to work in those domains with those, with the, with the real flows of life that exist outside of simply our, um, you know, reality that we can see around us. Mm -hmm. yeah, because you've talked about um, Anne Baring's work from the mm. lunar age, the solar age, and, you know, I think in, in many parts of, of your thesis, you're implying or suggesting and even referencing this, this feminine creative aspect. So 
um, that intrigues me. And that's, you know, I'm, I wish to, to pull it out and, and ask you about it. And so mm -hmm. Jim has, has asked the question about evil. Um, so I'm going to ask the question about love. And, um, you know, I was intrigued by your description of love and light and how uh, light expands and, and love connects. So can right. you describe again, or can you in your own words, talk about how they relate to speed and potential and how important an aspect is this in your evolution uh, work? Uh, we've had all the big themes and <laughs> love. <laughs> um, Start maybe in relating it to seed and potential. Seed and potential. <clears throat> well, um, in that sense, love is the thing that connects them. Um, and, uh, and it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that in the model, it's the heart chakra that sits right at the center of the octave system between the fourth and the fifth system, um, because it's that energy that enables the integration and connection uh, in the process that actually it's from from the heart uh, that we co-create uh, not from the head uh, both in my experience of uh, you know moving into a space of silence uh, in the heart where absolutely which is the you know the node the central point in the uh, right at the middle of the of the Taurus, the space of stillness or the, the midpoint of the black hole, um, where both nothing seems to happen, but also where all potential is. So I think it's <clears throat> through the heart and through love that we create the conditions for um, life. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's go for the, the Love, we can talk about it uh, never ending, but let's get to a, uh, let's say a more concrete subject of intelligence and information. Again, I mean, I mean, there's so much in here. I mean, my background is complex systems. I, I was very pulled into how you describe and, and relate to evolution and to complex systems. And of course, intelligence information is all part of that, especially in today's age where these are, are critical um, terms, which have a lot of baggage. You know, information has a lot of baggage in today's terminology. So the way you use it, uh, you often uh, use intelligence and you mention it, it can, it can be or is the same as information. Um, so if you consider these terms as interchangeable, some people may, may find that a point of contention. How would you defend that position? I don't see them as interchangeable. I'd love to know where you got that impression in the thesis. So um, please do send me that page reference at some point. Um, <clears throat> Information, as I'm understanding it here, is uh, yeah. If it's if information is what sits on the outside of the the membrane of the torus, as it were, through which light shines, and then it also permeates everything. It's literally in formation. It's what brings things into form. That's what information uh, is. And that in the way I'm, I'm using it here in um, evolution, the intelligence uh, I would see more as like the knowing uh, of a system, the, the, the intelligence of an entity, the something that it has maybe the, <clears throat> maybe the information it has access to. How about that? The intelligence of an entity is about the, the amount or quality of information it has access to or is yeah, is, is, um, sorry, it's, it's kind of access to, but it's really, uh, um, how expanded the, how, how expanded its awareness is, how the more that the, that the, um, the skin of the torus expands, the more information, of course, it can hold. And so that is the entity maybe becomes more intelligent as its information um, expands and differentiates into more greater refinement. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, that that pulls into into my next kind of line of inquiry because you talked about the the wave-like awareness, 
And uh, you've mentioned in the thesis that our more expanded wave-like awareness is able to hold more of reality without getting fixated on specific parts. And so is able to observe more of life. Okay. I think you started to, to kind of talk about that with the membrane, but can you, can you continue and explain how this uh, awareness enables us to observe more of life? Well, <clears throat> I guess that I'm, well, even though, you know, in the classical, um, many of the classical quantum traditions, they've talked about the wave collapses into uh, a particle. I think what I, the way I've come to see it more is that the waves cohere into standing waves rather than actually collapsing into anything. Um, but I was using that metaphor to describe two kind, kinds of consciousness or two kinds of uh, ways of, of engaging uh, reality. And the waveform was suggesting what you're doing is you're suspending judgment because it's in a way it's, it's the decision or the human judgment, not necessarily in a negative way about something that brings it into, into fixed form. It's our belief, like our fixed belief about something that holds it in form. So obviously if you are in that, what I've ended there, described as particle consciousness and you're focused on, you're focused on the parts, uh, then though you've, you're in a kind of fixated, fixed mindset, as it were, on holding these things in place and uh, missing the space in between or the other possibilities that might also exist. So I was uh, suggesting that the, the more wave-like consciousness is, is, is holding open the field of possibilities and not um, uh, collapsing or cohering things too quickly, mm -hmm. uh, but seeing how those, you know, how all the different pieces or the different uh, layers of information and energy um, want to come into a form that's most adequate for life at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, Peter. Um, so you're talking about these, these expanded possibilities of observing life, and you, of course, went into the implications and practicalities in the case study. You had an organizational volution. Um, now, so my, you know, my question is, you, you tried to describe it, and I, you know, Obviously, it's very difficult to describe in terminology these, these processes, especially when you're with a group of people. So you describe it in some kind of observational mode, let's say. Um, can, what, do you feel that you, your case study I, was totally successful as how you wish to, to, um, to research it? And could you talk about your experience and feelings after your case study? Um, I could probably what might be more useful to me is if you have an opinion about the case study, I'm sensing that behind your question, you actually have an opinion about it, which could be useful information for me to be able to respond to. Is that true or is it really an open question? Well, it's an open question, but of course, you know, um, I'm not exactly playing devil's advocate, but I'm playing someone's advocate. So um, let's say that I didn't find that your case study was totally convincing. Convince me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, I have to go and reconnect to the case study. That's going to take me a moment. Um, this it has to be details, you know, from the top of your head or any, any feelings, reminiscences or, or understanding that you took away from the case study for yourself. Well, actually, actually, um, I remember the, I remember the event and it was, um, it was actually an important part of, uh, of things shaping up for me as I was having that experience. I was realizing what the dynamics were that were going on in that collective and <clears throat> how they did actually start to fall into this story of, you know, how I was seeing the world as it were. Um, so, um, from that perspective, it was uh, it was an early stage of the journey. Um, I remember. Um, is it uh, is it a, is it the best possible example of how evolution might play out in an organisational situation? Um, I don't know. I'd have to go back and review it again, probably with the perspective I have now. Uh, but it's a good idea. Um, certainly, the more the more examples we can tie in to illustrate 
how the theory works, uh, the better. Um, but at the moment, I don't have, it's not present enough for me, for me to be able to, you know, say, go into any more detail about it, really. Okay, that's fine. I mean, again, talking about the, the individual experience, because, you know, you brought it down at the end of your thesis into the individual, which is rightly so. So, and the individual, of course, is you, Peter. So, uh, have you reached new contemplative conclusions about your perception on the universe uh, after finishing the thesis? What have your uh, epiphanies after the thesis, which you haven't actually written in the thesis itself, are there any? Well, I think, I guess what I'm still integrating is um, this uh, realization of um, how really, you know, the, this present moment is, is all there is. And as we, uh, as we navigate from moment to moment, we're both transforming the apparent past and the apparent future. But ultimately, the past and the future are really just our experience of something in the present that we call the past or that we call the future. So what it means to to really be living life uh, really in, in a co-creative present state and state of presence, which is what the <clears throat> evolution theory suggests um, is the most co-creative space to be. Um, I guess that's, that's the kind of, um, now that I've told myself that that's how things work, I now have to try to Im embody a way of living that uh, perspective. So that's, um, I guess, the edge I'm on now. Okay. Thank you, Peter. I'm aware that time's up and I want to give Georgia time to speak. So um, I want to say, Peter, that I think that you've lived your thesis and, um, and that you've shown that. And uh, thank you for sharing it with me and wish you all success in the future. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Kingsley. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kingsley. Well done, Peter. You're doing very well. Just hang on a little bit longer. Um, uh, where, where, where to start? There, is, there are advantages and disadvantages being the last person commenting on your thesis and asking questions. First, invisibly, I was holding my hand that Kingsley is asking the questions I wanted to ask. Like, oh God, just can't be, just can't be, never mind. And Jim, of course, and Will. So I try not to repeat uh, any of those questions. And before I, I ask some questions and comment on your thesis, I'd like to just segue back to what um, Jim was asking you about consciousness. Um, I'd like to make a bold statement that in my, in my view, nobody knows what consciousness is. I think we just really, it's many, let me substantiate this claim. First, I think we are lacking the um, vocabulary. We need to evolve our languages. And second, I think we're so far from the understanding what consciousness is and how to describe it. So this is, this is my bold claim. And uh, I really appreciate Buddhism. Um, because it puts the emphasis not just on the acquired knowledge, but the experience itself. So your experience of consciousness or whatever else, it is your experience. And according to Lama Anna Gorika Govinda, the, one of the greatest uh, Tibetan Lama, he said that you cannot really negate the individual experiencing consciousness and describing whatever. So at this stage of my life, uh, I really more going and, and directing myself away from the intellectual um, application that could be consciousness more like experiencing it. So your response to Jim, I think, was really spot on. It is your experience. It is your definition. And when you were talking about the field, I really try to shy away using field anymore and more using the terminology of plenum, even that is, that is not enough, even that is not extensive enough. 
And you describing, uh, or rather Jude was describing that your thesis is a work in progress. Absolutely. You can write your thesis until you actually pass on to another dimension and it's still not completed. So up until now, that is what you came to, uh, to understand what, what life is really. And I was really um, uh, looking forward to reading your thesis, not just because of getting to know you more, like we said, but also I knew that you were in that, in that uh, plenum of sub subjective interest that I love so much. And I, and I really respect uh, Jude as a scholar and a person. I knew that you would come up with something really interesting and it is clearly original it is clearly original i would like to hear from you probably at the very end of our little discussion because i really don't want to keep it too long that how you think um your work is going to help humankind to evolve but before answering the question let's just go to the very very beginning in your abstract you say that everything that is part of life is created out, out of a tension between current and potential reality that represents a vacant niche in the ecology of life. My question is that is the tension only between current and potential reality? How about the information stored in the holographic planum left before? And do you think that information really effects the becoming. Uh, so you're suggesting the um, past? Yeah. The role for, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I'd agree. Um, I guess what I was, um, um, when I was saying the present, I was assuming the past was kind of collapsed up into mm -hmm. the present. So from everything that had gone before based on where I am now, or something is now, the desire, the impulse, um, for the future in that tension field. And yes, absolutely. The, um, the past plays a role, it seems to me, in my personal experience, and, you know, in that kind of twin particle dynamic, that if there's a stretch into greater consciousness, awareness, or light, then it shines stuff on things that, mm. you know, need transforming in a, in a way to be able to take that step. Um, I have, I, uh, you know, it's, I, I say that, and I have also had an experience of being able to be in a state of consciousness where I completely um, f seem to be completely freed from that past. Mm -hmm. that there's a state of being able to, you know, the kind of it doesn't exist kind of thing. And, and there's a, it doesn't last for long, you know, it kind of slowly yeah. sinks its hooks back in. But there does seem to be a, a state where we do somehow are somehow able to liberate ourselves from those patterns or those shadows or whatever it is that's kind of keeps rising up mm -hmm. into our awareness. But those would be more peak experiences, I'd say, than stable states. Yeah, I think it is, it is a beautiful feeling once you are in that imageless observation isn't it that is really how really i see that expensiveness this infinite expensiveness and uh, and well done to you that you 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 really jumped into the deep end to try to describe what uh, what what life is and what evolution of complex systems is really um let, let, i would like to know more about your worldview and your belief system and like to ask the, sec uh, the second question that in your understanding what is the instigating force behind this tension to create a new do you describe it as god do you describe it as super consciousness or else um yes i, I the only i've just described it as what's what's behind the impulse i don't know if there's anything behind the impulse the impulse emerges out of the dynamics of the the whole. Um, so, in, in relationship to the parts, where somehow, in the evolutionary process, a uh, like a tension, like a, a tension arises, a need 
for something uh, that isn't there yet. Um, mm -hmm. And it may be through, you know, the increasing pro the process of increasing differentiation that as, you know, we move towards greater interconnectivity and wholeness is also increasing crystallization and differentiation that, that in, that's the process that maybe creates these gaps or these tensions and they don't i don't see it as a negative thing i mean because it, it can through humans as it were it can express itself in a desire you know or uh, and maybe it is the quest as jim the quest for happiness you know the quest for wholeness mm -hmm. um that pulls us in some direction I, I it feels to me more like um a dynamic rather than that there's a cause a kind of something out there that makes it happen. So is, in your understanding, is this, does this dynamic has a purpose or intention? Well, yeah, I mean, my belief is that the general directionality of life is towards increasing wholeness and increasing differentiation. Mm -hmm. that, okay, uh, now, that, that was going to actually yeah. my second question because on page 108, you're quoting Wilber saying that evolution has directionality. And uh, many times I spoke with, uh, with Urban about that, what he believed. And, and I was actually reflecting on what, what really I believe, that uh, the, mm. the purpose or the meaningfulness or the directionality of, uh, of evolution. And, uh, and, and seeing that how many different trees and animals and shapes and forms they are, my understanding that evolutionary evolution is probabilist. They're trying out different forms and mm. ideas and... Uh, and, and notions and see that which is viable, which is durable, which can actually create even greater complexity. So mm -hmm. you just, just answered the question yeah. wasn't, that wasn't clear to me. And uh, um, what was, there was something I was going to say there to add to that uh, directionality. Uh, it's gone. But yes, I agree. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So the second last is that the evolution phases on. Um, Page, I think it's nine, 91, 93. No need to look at it because the, those X shape uh, fig, figures you you presented, uh, mm. saying that it is in um, energy builds up within within the seed. And I'm mm. just talking the same thing. What Kingsley was that is it actually energy or information? And mm. this is really that what mm -hmm. really in vogue mm -hmm. now. And I I can see you smiling, and I would just eyes <laughs> and really. I'm going to give her the answer she wants, don't you worry. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> so Information it, expressed yeah. as energy matter. Yes, yes, thank you. I would like to say the same thing. So the very last thing is, Peter, how does your, how does your theory help humankind? Well, I have a sense that the key kind of step phase that we're moving into collectively now um, having got to say this boundary in a way between you know the six central the four central systems and come up here and this edge into the yellow turquoise which are more the yin based systems we've had the more yang based here that have given us this sense of um, given us the sense of, of, of distinction um, but also separation, and that we seem to have forgotten or pushed away our relationship to um, the earth and, and to these two foundational systems, really, that are about the earth and the body. Um, and that the only reason, that, or the main reason that we've ended up where we are as humanity is precisely because of that. Uh, there's no way if we could, if we had, were actually remembering that we were, that we are the earth. Right? If we hadn't forgotten that rather obvious fact that we are the earth, then how on earth would we have been able to do any of this to ourselves? So, uh, you know, it's just, so, so I think that my, so my sense is that the, 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 the theory and the practices related to it will have the implication embedded in them um, that we have work to do in the in the you know in the reintegration of uh, body earth uh, the feminine at that level um, <clears throat> and that they give us practices to be able to access the 96 percent or whatever it is the reality that we say we can't see where 
the other where these other dynamics go on and actually enable us to co-create with far more of life um, than we currently do and to notice that it is there's, there are other intelligences out there who probably have a slightly broader perspective on on uh, life than, than we might do so there's a bit of humility that comes with it but that we learn to um, co-create with those other dimensions and therefore the kind of interventions that we come up with um, are far more likely to be of service to life as a whole than ones that we come up with from a place of separation and believing that we're the only ones that have to work it out on our own. Thank you Peter. Well if you say this to your local shopkeeper, your local shopkeeper is going to look at <laughs> the eyes because it's happened to me. <laughs> So uh, you need to prepare yourself that many people, when they see a big smile on your face and ask you that why you're smiling, you say, I just got my, you know, my PhD. And then, uh, you know, then, so what was your PhD about? So you need to actually <laughs> learn how to, to not dumbing down your language, but how to mm. simplify it and really say it in a, in a mm. very short sentence, because you are a messenger. And you mm -hmm. don't need to talk to the converted as we are. But there is a huge amount of people who are not used to this language that we are speaking. Mm -hmm. And then that is your task to, to influence their life. So this is just for work in progress project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. From my point of view, I, I, uh, I'm finished with my questions and answers. Um, before I ask uh, Peter and the audience to leave, uh, any of the uh, members of the dissertation committee would like to make any final comments? No? Wonderful. Thank no, you I so think much. We've grilled him enough, Dr. Zabo. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, right, then I would like to say. Um, goodbye to our listeners and i'm sure they enjoyed this absolutely rich and wonderful um presentation of peter and discussion of uh, the dissertation committee thank you very much peter wonderful i shall contact you very soon in an email <laughs>